You're listening to NIL Now, a podcast dedicated to the name, image, and likeness of today's college and high school athletes. So we're going to explore the crazy and wildly interesting world of name, image, and likeness. NIL Now, covering the latest sports business headlines and keeping you informed on the nation's top performers. This is NIL Now, where the stars of tomorrow are getting noticed today. It's the Wild Wild West, but we're wrangling it in. Presented by Headline Studio. And read it. Here are your hosts, Lauren Sisler and Kevin Jones. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to another episode of NIL Now, a production of Headline Studio and Reddit. We are out wherever you listen to your podcast. Make sure you subscribe. Hope you all had a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. we got a good show in store for you. Later on, we're going to speak with Stanford football player Tyrion Williams, so stick around for that. But in the meantime, I got KJ here to go over some of the most recent headlines in NIL. NIL headlines. With that being said, uh, we dive into our first headline, and this one entails college football analyst Joel Klatt, who said on his talk show recently that he believes college athletes have too much power in the world of NIL. Klatt said NIL will not work in the long term because the players have too much power, much like schools used to have too much power before NIL. So Klatt, who did play football at Colorado in the early 2000s, mentioned how players can make really good money on NIL and then transfer whenever they want. Just your initial take on sort of where he's coming at, because I know that we've delved into this and talked about sort of that fine line where it's the wild, wild west. We've got to wrangle them in. We're the wranglers here. Do you think that that's a little bit of a stretch to say they have too much power? Just lay it out there for me, KJ. I'm begrudgingly saying that players do have a lot of power in, in the situation. And I think that the universities or athletic departments had maybe too much power in the situation before. So there needs to be some type of balance where it's not one over, over the other. So I do, I do think he's, I think he's kind of right. You know, uh, there you have players and families and situations who don't really understand the landscape and not really thinking about, Going from nothing to having everything, you know what I'm saying? Or asking for everything, not being allowed to ask for anything and now asking for everything. So I think that there's a, it needs to be a fine line there, 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 some type of middle ground. Yeah. Well, and that's, I think that's kind of what he's alluding to here. You know, he said right now it's kind of one-sided and it just can't continue that way. When I talk with coaches around the country, they all say the same thing. It's unsustainable because there's no recourse. And so you know, you've given more liberties to these players, but there has to be some sort of recourse or some sort of ruling, some sort of even playing field. And I think that's kind of what a lot of these coaches are arguing. And around the the block of college football coaches, you know, when I sit in these meetings, a lot of them share much of the same sentiments about the whole thing. And the frustrations that come along with it, but also the it's here to stay, so we have to play the game. And so I think that the one question I would have is what is the fix for all this? What is the magic bullet? What is the, what is the, you know, the magic word that's going to fix all this and make this all better? And I think that this is just going to be an ongoing process as we've talked about over the last 31 episodes, 30 episodes. Now we're on 31 of what this could look like. And I don't know that anyone has a a, a specific answer, but I think a lot of it's going to just sort of be sort of moving that goalpost and saying, okay, well, this is working good. This is not working good. This is what we need to change and kind of go from there. A lot of the universities or athletic departments probably need to, for one, have a specific type of budget. Maybe the budget is evenly, you know, across the, I would say the conferences. I think, you know, we have some coaches talking about that. Like how do we, you know, make things unified and everyone's playing with the same amount of, you know, budget, but then you got to have those relationships, you know, it's it's really important that the relationships of the university. So the brands, the Nikes, Under Armour, the Adidas, all those big companies, like I said, they're spending money at those universities or having those, you know, deals done and all that stuff is not really going, you know, towards the players. I think it's, I think it's, uh, there's still a lot of other parts that need to be fixed and talked about outside of just what our players are asking for, what are they getting? 
you know, there's a there's a lot of other business that's going on that needs to be talked about, I think. So we're just at the ground level with it right now. You know, it's only been, what, two seasons, season and a half in NIL. Long way to go and a short time to get there. I mean, <laughs> down, no, watch old bandit run. <laughs> yeah. Anyways. Um, okay. Moving right along. So Kirby Smart, he's kind of diving in on the, the I want an even playing field train. He said recently on the Paul Feinbaum show uh, that uh, how states can pass laws to help their in-state schools. We mentioned those Missouri laws that Eli Drinkwitz's involvement in the NIL is one of the latest episodes as well. He mentioned the possibility of SEC-wide NIL law that all member schools would agree on. He also said this quote, it really complicates it because you're going to those states yourself to recruit. The coach said, I've heard the analogy used that the railroad tracks would be a different size in those states than yours. And they're meant to be even. You're supposed to go from state to state, go recruit kids. There's some inherent want, I guess, out of those states to keep their kids in state and allow them to get revenue as high school athletes or not have to have the same rules as some of the teams have with collectives and able to communicate with them. I just want a fair playing ground. I like for everybody to be balanced and not have to go and try to manipulate the rules and laws in your state to give you a better chance of signing a football player. I don't like that. I don't think that's fair for the kids. I think they should be able to go where they want to go. I mean, I think that's, I mean, that's probably a fair assessment and probably something I'm hearing from a lot of the coaches. I guess if you took a poll, I'd say a lot of coaches align with what Kirby Smart's saying here. Hmm. You just won the national championship, Mr. Smart. (laughs) So I don't want to hear what you got. You just stick to doing what you're doing the way it's been doing and you got to go and go to them on bone. (laughs) 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 They just won the national championship. These guys are killing it the way they're doing it. And I'm pretty sure they got a robust NIL program that's a lot better than other schools. So you probably needs to be careful on so much talk on how it should be even because, <laughs> you know, if everybody evens it out, you know, that's going to close his gap really quick. So I would be careful with that type of rhetoric. NIL Now with Lauren Sisler and Kevin Jones. If you want to learn more about name, image, and likeness, you need to go to The Source. The NIL Now podcast from Headline Studio and Reddit highlights the The biggest biggest storylines. NIL is not a cherry on top. It needs to be a part of these young men and women's future to, you know, further their careers. You should be able to leave college with something. Subscribe to NIL Now on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts. All righty, cruising on into our second segment of the podcast, and we have our good friend Bobak Hayeri on the horn with us. What is up, Bobak? Everything's good. How are you doing? This was a topic that we were actually going to cover last week, and I was really excited about it, but uh, we wanted to save proper time for it because I think it's a great question that was teed up by our friend, uh, I guess a Georgia Bulldog fan, C.T. Burks, submitted this uh, on the Reddit channel. So... Would you rather have a $10 million head coach or a $10 million NIL budget? Ready, set, go. Well, and I'm going to actually add just a little bit to that. The, the, if you get a $10 million head coach in this particular scenario, your NIL budget shrinks to just $1 million for the entire roster each year. And but if you have a ten million dollars to spend on players, you're only allowed to spend a million dollars per year on your head coach. So it makes it kind of interesting because one, which one would you rather be restricted on? And the answers were kind of interesting on this. I mean, certainly <laughs> a couple of people wanted to just snipe at certain head coaches, certain programs, you know, an Arkansas fan, no way Pablo kind of kicked it off with, you know, I've already witnessed incompetent coaches ruin talented rosters. So I take a $10 million coach and trust he'll be able to recruit decently enough to get past and skirt a limited NIL budget. You know, one of my favorite readers on our CFB, Crustang, he's a Rutgers fan, so he's got nothing to lose. Everything is, you know, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Lauren, but you know, you know Rutgers fans. Oh, no. Oh, no. fans. Oh, my my God. Uh, he says AM has taught us that the answer is the coach, but an LSU fan, you know, 
actually, A and M has taught us just to burn the money. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, we. I don't know if we can let you slide with that one, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, the California has came out of them, uh, Lauren Harry. The, the jab at good old Rutgers. I know that's just rude. Y'all are rude. <laughs> Dude. You know, but I just have to say, South Carolina fan Beamer Believer pointed out AM had both a $10 million head coach and like a seemingly $10 million NIL budget and still went five and seven. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think, I mean, what do you guys think? What would you rather have? Would you rather drop $10 million in your head coach and kind of? You know, be stuck in the old days, more or less, with with a limited budget towards players. Or would you want that uh, money just to go to luring the best talent available? Well, here's the thing. And Dean and I kind of talked about this earlier before we jumped on the pod. There are just some schools out there that are killing the NIL game. Some that you might expect. Some that you might not expect. And then there's just some that are literally dropping the ball. Am I right? But then there's also there's also schools out here that that this is like the the case right now. They only got about that amount of money, and their coach is making a lot of money. So this is it's actually a real scenario. It is a real scenario. I mean, you know, I guess I, I you know just when you kind of break things down, first of all, I guess ten million dollars, and are, I guess are we talking about ten ten million dollars for just one particular team? like a football team or a, a basketball team, or is this like all together, right? This is just one team, right? So, you know, if you're talking football, I mean, does $10 million uh, get the job done? Does that far outweigh good coaching, in your opinion? I think, you know, is, did, how, how far does $10 million really get you in today's world of NIL, I guess would be the question that I would ponder in order to amply add, like to, to at, answer this question um accurately i think 10 mil gets you a lot it gets you a lot. it definitely has you in the game it has you being competitive in this landscape i think what ohio state and you know a few months back said something about 14 mil or something like that their head coach came out with that um <clears throat> but i thought i thought that was a large number and i still okay. do but i think 10 is definitely has you in the game for sure so, um, you know, I think if you kind of look at coaches that have been out there that are doing it well, have done it well on a large budget, i.e. your Nick Sabans of the world, your Kirby Smarts, have obviously uh, been really good at building championship uh, dynasty-type programs without NIL. Um, I think the real question then becomes, and and, you know, you really don't know this because we don't, we don't see teams like Alabama falling behind in the NIL space, although they, you know, Nick Saban will argue that obviously the the drama that happened last summer with the NIL and the jabs at uh, Jimbo Fisher there kind of just make you wonder, because I know a lot of these coaches also that are making this kind of money. I mean, do you see, are, are we hearing of these coaches that are making 10 mil really pushing and telling Others, they need to start anting up on the NIL space, um, you know, because it, it's it seems like it's kind of a mixed bag of, I guess, uh, what's the word for it? Um, I'm drawing a blank here, y'all, but it, I guess just opinions, opinions on, you know, and and we we covered this a little bit earlier. KJ talking about Kirby Smart, just in in the fact that um, coaches still feel like there's not a level playing field here. So how do you level that playing field, I think, would be the big question. And does that play into where we're at? I guess I'm probably diving into this a little too seriously because this is such a hypothetical question. But, you know, whatever. Well, yeah, and I mean, I think it's interesting to think for some of these $10 million head coaches, would they be able to overcome that million dollar, you know, that million dollar NIL budget only, a million dollar NIL budget by simply relying on the fact that, hey, I, I can get you into the league. You know, somebody like Nick Saban or... Kirby Smart certainly can lean on that uh, and perhaps overcome what might be a budget issue in terms of competing for recruits. But certainly, 
Um, there is something to be said of just loading an entire team with, with stars, you know, especially if the transfer portal comes into play, you know, honestly, it was kind of funny to watch some of the Nebraska fans kind of grit their teeth of, you know, sometimes $10 million for a head coach doesn't really go that far, or, or sometimes they don't necessarily win. Um, and you know, on a lighter note, the Iowa fans said, you know, well, it's really only $9 million because $1 million goes to the coach's son. Folks cannot resist the Brian Ferentz love, uh, especially uh, <laughs> Pizza Yolo ninety six. That's the username of that particular gentleman. But I mean, Iowa fans definitely have a have a love hate relationship with with their father's son coaching staff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kevin, give us your way in. I feel like uh, I'm over here spinning my wheels in the mud. Bobak is uh, giving us some truths. I mean, if you got to be on one side of the fence or the other, what, 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 where are you where are you shooting your shot? I think it's somewhere in the middle. Like, you know, when I when I first read the question, I was like, if I had to choose, I guess I got to I got to go with the the NIL budget. But then I don't know what that does. like you have to have a co- you have to have the right coach, right? And the right coach isn't cheap these days. <laughs> so Well, and that's the thing too because I think culturally speaking, the culture in the locker room is just a much a big part of it, right? Because if you if you have a program that's making, ten, you know, spreading 10 million out amongst the, the locker room, but you have a coach that's not keeping you guys in check, keeping your egos in check, keeping the culture in check, then you know, that's going to bleed over into the field. And then it's going to be garbage, garbage time every day. Right. You know, there was a, uh, I thought an interesting comment by Michigan state fan, Byzantine merchant, you know, he thinks it's coaching because you might not win a national championship without elite talent, but it's still a lot more fun to win eight plus games a year with what you got than it is to win seven or less. So he thinks even if you wouldn't necessarily get the caliber of talent to win a national championship, a better head coach would at least put a better product on the field year after year. And I think that's what, that's what he was leading towards. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely an interesting uh, topic of conversation and one that, could really go both ways and and I don't know I mean I think this is a, a question that could really be pondered as we get more of a sampling and seeing what these bigger budgets can do for schools in the NIL space I think when you start to see those schools that had that NIL money above some of these schools that are focused more on the coaching side of things and that are you know taking all that in consideration your 10 million dollar coaching things then we might see more of that but right now we're only our our sampling is only going with what seems like texas (laughs) a&m i think you got to have the coach at the end of the day just like look at Deion sanders at colorado and all the the buzz he's created from just being who he is probably without a substantial nil budget they may have a better one than they had obviously but you know those type of coaches who have a personality they they're like magnets They, they they draw people to their program so I would I would say like my final answer would be coach. You gotta have you gotta start off with the coach first and then get the budget up. That's my that's my my um, observation so far. So ultimately, the coach has got to be able to recruit too, right? Exactly. I mean, bottom line. And there are plenty of plenty of programs who have coaches who can recruit their butts off, and their NIL program is crap. <laughs> so, but you got to You got to be able to recruit. You got to have the, and the the coaches to do that, and that's how you get the players. Oh, okay. Well. All right, let's jump into our next Bobak centric headline because this is going to be mostly you, Bobak. Uh, you know, this stuff flies right over my head. I'm learning though. So when I sit here, I'm taking notes, I'm taking mental notes just so I can better understand it. So, House Subcommittee considering federal regulatory body to oversee NIL rights for college athletes. Give us the scoopy scoop on this story and what this means for NIL and legislation. Yeah. So what we're seeing again, it fits into the bigger kind of chaos that is going in the NIL sphere with all the different states trying to create their own regulatory rules. And then there's this separate push on the federal level to see if there can be an overarching federal regulation on all of this. Because as we've talked about before, you know, with all the states trying to have their different, you know, regulatory frameworks, Oklahoma, as we talked about before, had that NIL bill that was going to allow college players to have basically agents for NIL deals. It was briefly sidelined because the governor vetoed every bill put on his desk for over a totally separate issue. But, you know, again, this past week, the Oklahoma legislature overwhelmingly overrode the veto. So that'll be signed into law. 
I mean, when I say overwhelmingly, I mean 120 to 13. So again, this these bills tend to get bipartisan support. They're pretty easy baskets in a lot of these states. So that's going to give Oklahoma its own framework, which at the time seemed like the one of the looser ones being offered in the sense it was saying the NCAA couldn't even go after people in the state of Oklahoma for violating those NIL rules. Meanwhile, Texas has also passed their own um, that's been sent to the governor's desk for signature. That similarly will allow schools to reward NIL donors with tickets and other items in exchange for playing athletes, and it'll allow entities that are legally separate from a school, such as some athletic fundraising foundations, to enter into NIL deals with athletes. And again, it it allows them to have some supposedly protection from the NCAA, saying the NCAA cannot penalize a school participating in or allowing activities authorized. And we've already talked about Mizzou in the past. They passed a law that apparently allows high school athletes who have signed a letter of an intent to receive NIL uh, NIL deals as well. So with all of that going on, there's all kinds of plans in Congress. I mean, in the past couple of weeks, we have seen uh, Senator Lindsey, uh, Lindsey Dodd from South Carolina propose something on the congressional side. We have uh, what has been discussed by and some reporting over by Dennis Dodd, as well as USA Today's uh, Steve Berkowitz. They've been reporting about this Florida congressman uh, who has been trying to pass the uh, or is trying to propose the Fairness, Accountability and Integrity in Representation of College Sports Act. So the Fair College Sports Act, because really, I'd swear if you, you can't be a congressman of any worth if you can't come up with a fancy, fancy acronym. But uh, in this particular bill, what they're saying and what the plan is, is that it would allow uh, it would it would require athletes to report deals within 30 days to kind of a central body um, that would give the NCA legal protection, but also create a central body for reporting what you earned in your NIL deal. And, and at the same time, all of these are adamant about keeping college athletes from becoming employees. And again, I want to I want to say that as I mentioned that you know there's a Senate version of this, there's this congressional version of it, and there's even another congressional version of it. There's some Ohio congressmen which are trying to introduce the student athlete level playing field act, which is a slightly different variant of what we just discussed. Their version um again would create a federal standard for NIL that would supersede conflicting state laws so that athletes and universities could play by the same standards. So that's kind of what's going on here. The reaction on on Reddit, and I think the reaction in the public was best summarized by um, Florida Fed NYPD Blue. He did two quotes of comments from the post. <laughs> that is Wait a second, I kind of like that name. <laughs> and it's a step in the right direction. So it's like the duality of man in the, in the reaction. People think it's either stupid and never going to pass, and some people think you know, this is a step in the right direction. So I guess it kind of, it sits on where you're going to be on how how balkanized, how separate, how disparate the state rules could be on NAL versus a level playing field. There are benefits to both, especially if your state's one of the ones that has the better rules. It'll be really interesting to see how all the SEC coaches and SEC fan bases, once they realize what's going on, if it turns into sort of well pushing their own Congress people to to pass more uh, more uh, unrestrictive laws, we'll see. I mean, at this point, though, what's going on at all these levels? This is an exciting time if you like to follow legislation, <laughs> which is exactly why people follow college football. You're listening to NIL now. All right, now it's time to welcome in our guest for the show, Tyrion Williams. He's a DB on the Stanford football team, signed many NIL deals, including that of Boost Mobile, uh, PSD Underwear, and SI Tickets, among others. He's a finalist also for the Hustle Award, which we've talked about before at the NIL Summit coming up soon, coming up later, uh, actually in June, uh, this upcoming week. And then, um, yeah, lots to unpack here. Lots uh, happening in your world, Tyrion. Uh, Thanks again for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. I uh, love being here. and love to meet you guys. Yeah. So first and foremost, uh, as a guy from Duluth, Georgia, I mentioned I live in Birmingham. So, you know, we're a few hours from each other, I guess, in theory. But you're out there in Stanford right now, out there in Cali. So uh, things are looking a little bit different on that side of the world. 
Uh, yeah, the Cali life is definitely different than uh, being from the South. Uh, definitely getting used to it. Uh, you know, different different culture, different weather, uh, different people. But it's all part of that uh, networking that I came out here for. So, yeah, what, I guess, what what drove you to leave the South and go to Stanford and uh, decide to take your career um, to maybe a different part of obviously the country and, and really where, as we all know, the culture is a little bit different there, but not, not in a good or bad way. It's just different. Yes. Uh, when I first came out here, I fell in love with the campus. It's beautiful out here. The people uh, out at Stanford, just amazing. Um, we're all on the same mission, uh, you know, better the world, better yourself, better, uh, you know, your networking, the uh, academics here are second to none. Uh, and then different people that I meet on a daily basis are all like-minded, all trying to be better. So. Uh, just having that instance and being able to come out here and, um, you know, get away from home, um, create a new network and create a new basis. It's just amazing. I love that. And before we jump into some NIL questions, and I'll let Kevin take the stand after this, but, uh, you know, talking about bettering yourself and academics, what are sort of your long-term goals? Obviously, I know football is the main focus. You're working on your NIL stuff. What is academically, what are your plans and hopes, dreams, goals, aspirations for when your football career does come to an end? Uh, aspirations definitely be like a CEO somewhere. Definitely want to uh, be controlled, you know, uh, be able to, um, you know, have my part into the world and definitely give back as a CEO figure, you know, higher figure, uh, but definitely just be able to give back and be able to be, uh, you know, successful and um, just be able to make my mark on the world. Do you know what, what industry, when you say CEO, you know what type of industry you want to be in? Uh, right now, um, my major is management science and engineering, so it'll be in the engineering industry. Um, so, yeah, let's jump into this NIL journey. Just tell us a little bit about your journey, how you got started, um, you know, what the process has been like for you. Just just bring us, enlighten us a little bit. Uh, I would say it's been a fun process. Uh, around this time last year, uh, obviously, I was in high school getting ready to go to college in, um, in Georgia. Um, NIL is not, you're not able to do like NIL from the high school level. So really it was getting, um, you know, it was something new, something that was just getting started. Didn't really know too much about it, but, um, definitely, uh, I did a lot, a lot of marketing, a lot of business, uh, classes, my elementary, middle school, and high school years. So I was able to take those talents that I learned from, um, those young years to be able to just transfer it over to my college years from an NIL basis. And now um, just doing big things, uh, you know, creating, I got my nonprofit that just started, um, able to, uh, you know, reach out, negotiate with different businesses uh, and just doing big things from the NIL standpoint that last year around this time, I didn't even think I was going to be able to be um, doing. So are you reaching out to companies yourself? Like, what does that look like? Just, you know, I know the listeners want to kind of hear what some of the players are doing to actually... um, you know, garner some of these deals. So is is this something that the school is set up? Or are you with a certain uh, collective or agency or is it just you or yourself doing it? Right. Uh, I don't have an agency. Uh, I do reach out myself. Some companies do reach out to me, but for majority, it's me reaching out to companies, uh, basically uh, giving like that elevator pitch the same way that a business, you know, does an elevator pitch. I give an elevator pitch of myself, what I bring to the table for the company, how we can help each other out and um, the different like, um, you know, attributes that I have that can help show what I can bring for the t- um, bring for the company. Well, since you're on the show, you want to give us the elevator pitch because I probably got. That some was going to be my next me. question. <laughs> you know, we don't, want, we don't spot, want you to give away the know. secret sauce necessarily. <laughs> I can't give away the secret little... sauce. But usually, <laughs> uh, something, something. yeah, usually when I um, reach out to a company, I first just introduce myself, tell them who I am, uh, go to Stanford University, uh, different things that I'm doing at Stanford. Uh, academic wise, then I also provide some, um, you know, athletic uh, information on what I'm doing, football player. And then I like to provide, you know, like different like hit points that probably like my nonprofit or different things I'm doing in the community, showing that, um, you know, a lot of the money that I do get from NIL goes back into the community. And then I like to see, um, like basically trying to like show like what a partnership could look like or any ideas that they have on a partnership. And then um, usually just end it in a you know, thank you. Uh, love to hear from you. And just show I have like like two or three infographics, basically just having information on me already that shows a lot of information about things I've been doing. So it's just easy to the point so they can be able to read and see who I am. That's awesome. Um, You mentioned uh, 
uh, I guess, kind of like your workflow and sort of how you go about it. What are some brands that you typically like to try to focus on um, and gear yourself towards? What are some that kind of stand out in your sort of must haves or want tos? Uh, a lot of brands that stand out, different brands that obviously brands that are around the area, Atlanta area or Palo Alto area. So brands that I can be able to, you know, contact directly, especially in Palo Alto. It's, uh, you know, a lot of tech companies out here. So it's easy to um, reach out to those brands. And then a lot of brands that also, you know, are in the community, giving back to the community. You know, um, people that I partner, companies that I partner with also a reflection of me and I'm a reflection of them. So I just can't partner with anybody. So anybody whose uh, mission statement is uh, well-written, understandable, have good reviews on um, them, you know, well-known in the community, giving back, doing uh, different um, things like that is always good. Yeah, and I guess, too, I would be curious, and, you know, you don't necessarily have to, to give us the uh, price point on everything, but, you know, when you negotiate brand deals, is, uh, is there a monetary um, compensation? Is it product trade? Is it both? And, you know, what's sort of your threshold? Like, what are you looking for? to make it sort of worth your time and really ultimately, um, you know, not necessarily just your time, but the, the opportunity to be able to create those relationships like you mentioned. Right. Uh, it can work both ways. It really depends on the company. A lot of the, uh, you know, just starting companies or in that first phase of their company, a lot of them do, uh, you know, maybe product uh, more so because they're just not getting to that point in their company. So they're trying to get their name out and different things like that. And obviously if I'm, uh, you know, showing their company on my social media, then I believe in what they're doing. And then down the line process, you know, we might be able to, uh, you know, change that uh, money more so. But right now we're doing the um, product and I believe in your company. And then down the line, we can work on something. And then the bigger companies more so, uh, they'll uh, probably do product and money or just money, depending on, um, you know, how they're structure and finance from their different meetings and uh, stuff like that. So I necessarily don't like look for like a, um, Money mark, like, boom, I need this money. If not, we're not partnering. No, it's uh, more so uh, teamwork from the um, their side and my side in terms of believing in what they're doing, believing in the uh, product they have. I love that. That's a really good approach. What would you say your um, your your top three deals are so far that, that you really enjoy being a part of? Ah, oh, man. I love all my deals. <laughs> you, sh- um, you should love all your deals because you're in them, but I'm just wondering, yeah. like, what are, what are ones that are like highlights for you that you really like really touches you, your, your morals, your mission, the things you want to get done in life and be a partner with and also like benefits them or maybe your charity or something like that. Just just trying to get a feel for the type of things you like to do. Right. Uh, I would say my uh, one of the first um, deals I had was Alpha Clothing. Uh, they're one of my uh, uh, they provide pr- um, they bring me all my suits, clothing wear that I uh that I, I usually wear. Uh, this weekend, I'll be wearing at the NIL Summit, one of the suits they provided. So they're definitely, um, you know, one of my favorites. I talk to them on a good basis on different things that I have going on. Um, Oki Shades, uh, they provide all my shades. Um, I love what they're doing um, and definitely um, providing me different pairs of shades whenever I go out, something like that. And um, um, Boost Mobile was a good one. I, I love the Boost Mobile one. That was a good uh, partnership. I have uh, definitely loved the, uh, you know, Boost Mobile brand, different things like that, different things that we were working on. And then they're also going to um, help me with my uh, nonprofit uh, further on down the line. So that's that's also a good one. Nice. So what, what type of deals, like when you get a deal from Boost Mobile, is it like something off of your phone bill or is it like some a specific phone? Like how did, how did that deal work out? Right. Uh, that deal, uh, we negotiated, we talked and it ended up being... Um, um, money and uh, product uh, provide the phone and uh, money uh, with the uh, free service on the phone. Uh, so that was definitely a, a good, you know, little um, partnership we have. And what did you do in return for that? What was the, I guess, the promotion that you did? What were some of the deliverables? Uh, some of the deliverables were like different posts uh, in the month. Um, it was like the contract went for like about six months. Uh, it was like different posts within a month uh, that they would request, like specific things that they were hitting on on uh, that time of month, to, uh, you know, that, the, that their brand was uh, specifically looking at. So I did different videos, different um, photo shoots for them for that. Okay, very cool. All right, before we let you go, talk to us a little bit about your nonprofit. You've, you've mentioned that a couple of times. I'm anxious to hear more about that and what you got cooking uh, up. Yes, um, I'm excited for that. It just got uh, passed. Um, 
It Takes a Village Foundation is what it's called. It just got passed this past weekend. Uh, my mom was helping me with that. So uh, we just got past uh, that standpoint. Uh, still working on that. Definitely doing big things with that. Uh, it's focusing on providing uh, groceries, housing, and different um, you know needs for uh, families in need or uh, children in need. Uh, kind of reflecting on what I did this past Christmas for, uh, you know, I did 10 families in the uh, metro Atlanta area, provided grocery housing and stuff like that for Christmas. So definitely was a blessing to uh, do that. And that just gave me a boost of, to my nonprofit. So a lot of the companies that I'm also working with, um, with NIL, they're also helping me with different things in the nonprofit in the future. So excited for that, excited to get that going. That is awesome. Um, that's, that, that's really awesome. And I, and I love how you are using this space to obviously, uh, you know, boost your personal brand, but that comes full circle with the philanthropic side of things. And I think it's, it's just great to see you're doing that. And obviously, you know, even so early in your career at Stanford and, uh, you know, it seems to me the sky's the limit. I think it's awesome that you can, uh, give back in that way, but also, uh, you know, continue working towards your personal dreams and aspirations as becoming a CEO of a company one day. So good stuff. Thank you for coming on the show, Tyrion. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Absolutely. And of course, you can follow Tyrion and everything he's up to on Instagram. Tyrion Williams just gave him the follow there. And you can also see what he's been doing with his foundation. It takes a village foundation. Uh, love the work you're doing and uh, keep, keep on keeping on. And we look forward to seeing you out on the football field here before too long, because we all know football season will be here before we know it. You can also follow us on the show, NIL Now Show, on Twitter and on Reddit. Tell a friend. Let us know what you think about the show. Find next week's episode out wherever you listen to your podcast. And do not forget to subscribe. Thank you again to Bob Akhairi, the Reddit College football team, for their help. You can follow them at Reddit College Football on Twitter and on the Reddit channel. I'm Lauren Sisler. My co-host is Kevin Jones. A big thanks to our audio engineer, Colin Schmeling, our associate producer, Dean Zolkowski, and our executive producers, Richard Diamond, Selena Roberts, and Scott Broder. Until next week, we'll see ya. Thanks for listening to NIL Now, presented by Headline Studio and Reddit.